Okay. So Luna is launching a brand new blog series that features well-respected medical professionals, where the focus is around sharing co core conversations regarding remote patient monitoring and innovation. Uh, we're extremely excited to have you on for this series, and we'd love to showcase you and UCSF with this interview on our blog site, as well as our social platforms. Uh, for those of you who are watching and reading this interview, Dr. Kencho Inaga is a pediatric pulmonologist, also known as Papa Bear Extraordinaire at the UCSF Benioff Children's Hospital, attended the medical school at the University of California, Irvine, completed his residency in pediatrics at UCSF Benioff Children's Hospital in Oakland, followed by a fellowship in pediatric pulmonology at Seattle Children's Hospital. During his fellowship, he also earned his master's degree in epidemiology from the University of Washington School of Public Health. Um, and he also has board certifications from the American Board of Pediatrics. So my first question for you is, what inspired you to become a medical doctor? And why did you decide to specialize in pediatric pulmonology? It's probably going to be a little cliche, um, but truly um, it was it did come from a, out of a desire to help others um, it, it was an evolution of course there was no singular event um, when i was in college i actually worked as a waiter um, at, a, at a retirement home um, and there not that i was helping someone but it was you know the job as a waiter was some was a, a job in the service industry right providing a service for people who wanted it or needed it um and not that i was saving lines at the time or anything like that but just even throwing an extra scoop of ice cream for the little old lady um in room 208 and it, that made her day um had an impact um and of course this was while i was in college uh, i was um, already had some inklings that i was going to possibly be in healthcare, um, but that service aspect, the, the engagement, you know, with, with other people certainly solidified that the desire to um, be in medicine, uh, because now you can take that aspect of connecting with patients, you know, whether it's with directly with the child, if you're, if you're a pediatrician like I am, um, and certainly also with the caregivers, and that's not limited to pediatrics, you know, we also have, I'm sure there's adult patients who have spouses and, and other people taking care of them as well. Um, and so connecting with patients and their caregivers um, is actually an important part of medicine, uh, sometimes even more so than actually knowing what the diagnosis is or to have all the facts, you know, in your mind. Um, so that, that, that was the primary motivation for going into, into medicine. Um, I quickly learned as I was going through my rotations, which all of us do uh, during our second and third years of, of, of medical school, that I really enjoyed working with children. Um, so it was a fairly easy uh, choice for me to go into pediatrics uh, because, you know, it spans from ages zero all the way to the mid-20s. And so lots of tremendous changes, of course, as the child is growing physically, mentally, behaviorally, developmentally, all these kind of things. And of course, working with, you know, their parents and their other caregivers was a big plus for me. And then when I was a resident, um, you know, now as a pediatric resident, um, I really enjoyed asthma. Um, and of course, that'll play into um, other questions, you know, later on to today. But um, I really, really enjoyed the asthma, uh, taking care of patients with asthma. I mean, of course, it was unfortunate, at least where I was, where I trained, we have a fair number of patients who are hospitalized um, for asthma. I and mean, even if they weren't hospitalized, they were seeing in our emergency departments, you know, for asthma, acute uh, asthma exacerbations. Um, and so understanding that asthma isn't just a breathing problem. Well, yes, breathing is, an, is a major part of it. But there are so many determinants in terms of what goes into what makes asthma severe or not. It's not just a matter of the biology. It could be related to the fact of where they live, what they're exposed to, their access to care, you know, all these kinds of things. Um, and particularly in pulmonology, um, that's one of the fun things about it. Uh, there is this element of a lot of pathophysiology, understanding how the lungs work, but also the fact of how the lungs respond to the environment. You know, we, you know, we're having this conversation in the fall of 2021 um, here in Northern California. We have dealing with a lot of uh, smoke from massive wildfires, you know, many hundreds of miles away. Um, and so understanding the impacts of that, you know, air pollution, um, and, as well as other things, right? COVID, flu, um, the, the lungs are particularly sensitive to our outward environment. Um, and lastly, 
when it comes to the lungs, I'm not stuck with just seeing my own patients. I get to see patients in a broad array of settings, whether it's in the emergency department, in the hospital, in the intensive care units, in the intensive care nurseries, and also caring and you know, helping taking care of other specialists, oncologists, gastroenterologists, endocrinologists, who take care of patients who may have a disease basis within that organ system, but may have breathing manifestations as a result of that. Uh, so I get to be everywhere. Um, so there's never really a dull day. Uh, there's never a dull moment. Um, I'm always learning new things, meeting new people. Um, so it's true. I, I think I do have a great opportunity to be everywhere um, and, and make a difference, hopefully. Okay. And then for digital health solutions and RPM, meaning like remote patient monitoring, it can help improve health by driving patient adherence and self-management while cutting costs. So, but in your opinion, what patient demographics are best suited for using digital health solutions? Yeah, I, th I think it'll matter in terms of what goal you're trying to achieve. Um, I think on the one end, there are certainly, I, I'm sure there's a subset of patients who are truly motivated and understanding and really trying to take control of their disease, not letting it define them. So of course, in speaking with asthma, uh, there are patients Young, you know, children and adults alike who are sick and tired of being breathless or coughing and having it impacting their school, their work, their home lives and those kinds of things. And so um, I think there are certainly one element where you have a, a population who really has a great set of motivation to say, I really want to take control of this because I don't want it to take control of me. Um, but I think, you know, in this particularly as we're having this conversation on Zoom rather than in person because of the COVID pandemic and all these kind of things. It also brings mm -hmm. up an issue of access. And so when I, and, and so in talking about demographics, I think there's also that element of pay, improving access to patients who may not otherwise have access to this, such a service, um, say as lung function monitoring. You know, in general, um, and this is one of the reasons, you know, why we've been working together for so long is the fact that you know, doing spirometry traditionally has always take, has, has taken place in the in hospital or in clinic setting. You, the patient had to drive over or come over to our clinics or to our testing facilities and get the breathing test done. Um, and, you know, through several iterations, right, we now have a product where it's, that's not necessary anymore, right? We actually can have a patient living you know, even in the next town, but, or even further off, you know, that's, you know, who may not be living close to a testing facility um, where we take it for granted because I can order it anytime I want. But imagine someone who lives hundreds of miles away. Uh, and so to uh, enable them to provide them that access to an important tool, it's not the only tool, but an important tool to help them again, take charge of their, uh, of their conditions. So they may not initially have that intrinsic desire to say, I'm going to take over this and then instead of letting it take over me, but at the very least, we're at least giving them the option now to have a tool that may, that wasn't otherwise going to be available to them. Right. Um, so um, I think, you know, again, this is, this is a really important time and it was by coincidence with the pandemic, but now we're actually improving access, you know, to those who may not otherwise have it at least readily available, even in this day and age. Exactly. You definitely heard it from several patients where, you don't even want to pretend like risk going outside to risk unnecessary exposure to getting COVID. So definitely understand that as well, while their doctors still want to monitor their lung health. And so what advice would you offer a physician that wants to start implementing digital health solutions into their practice? Uh, that's a good question. I, I think, again, it, it all depends on what the goals of that practice may be. Um, and Probably my 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 my, uh, my my first bit of advice would be to probably start with a finite or at least starting small or something in a manageable area. Have a very predefined goal in terms of who you're trying to target. Whether again, whether you're trying to say, well, within my practice, I might be covering a geographic area, and either this population or this patient population living in this general area within my catchment area, we just had a really hard time either getting them in to do the testing or. You find that I mean, maybe independent of geography um, that you're taking, again, your, let's say your severe asthmatics, right? Your patients with severe asthma. And you're looking back at your, at your, at your practice, you know, your practice model and saying like, well, what is it that makes them having, you know, be severe? Is it a fact that, you know, we're having troubles, you know, titrating the medications because we don't have all the information available to us. And so even if they live down the street or whether they live 200 miles away, 
you can then say, well, all right, we're going to focus on, on, on incorporating digital health and re remote patient monitoring for this population. So I think at the very least, the, you know, the, the, these practice managers are going to have to start thinking about who we want to start up with first and establishing feasibility. Um, and then from there, it, I, you'll find, I think you'll find that you can quickly then expand to other areas to say, all right, well, now we've demonstrated that, yes, it works for this population. Now, who's going to be the next group of people or, or find a logical expansion from there to say, now we can increase the access and, and utilize it more, uh, you know, for whatever it works in the practice. So okay. I would say, yeah, start small and be specific. And then from there, I think it's going to be much easier to expand, um, you know, within your own time frame. Okay. And so using your knowledge and experience in medicine for the last 15 years, what do you think the use of digital health solutions, like, and how do you think it'll evolve um, within the respiratory healthcare space over the next five years? You know, the irony with, with, with healthcare is that I'm sure, you know, Sharvi, you know that when it comes to technology and innovations, healthcare, ironically, are, are the slowest adopters of, of, of technology, right? We still utilize pagers and these kinds of things. Um, I think that being said, you know, whether you want to look at it as a positive or negative, you know, the COVID pandemic has forced, has truly forced and just changed healthcare in general in terms of how we're going to do it. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, I mean, it's, it's happening even in, in the workplace where we may never go back to the quote unquote good old days or whatever you want to call them to the pre-pandemic days where everyone just goes back to the office. Everyone, everyone goes back to clinic, right? In terms of in-person visits, telehealth, telework, whatever you want to say, but virtual, uh, the virtual platform is here to stay. Um, and so, again, regardless, certainly I think in terms of improving access for those who are geographically far away, um, but, but even for whatever reason, those who may not be far away, they may be unwilling or unable to come in anyways, you know, regardless of how we, you know, how this pandemic plays out, that there's going to be some bit of a hybrid model where we doctors are still going to have, yes, we're going to reopen our clinics and we, and we already have, right? We have some patients being seen in person. And we will, we, will, we will utilize our in per, you know our our in person based testing facility of, uh, infrastructure, and those who may not maybe come in as frequently, um, but but for the remainder of the time, we can't just go and just allow to have these big gaps in, in in missing data in terms of their lung function and their symptoms and their medications. All medication medicine still needs to continue, and so if we're going to continue this on a virtual platform, then we also want to augment that right with objective data lung function data to help us with our patient decision making, right? So already, whether you're working from home for, you know, just for work, it's going to be the same thing where this is, this, this is going to be a regular part, a routine part, I think, of digital health, right? Um, and I think this has already been started in other areas, right? Um, digital stethoscopes, other things where um, it's just, it's not going to always happen on site, you know, where the physician is. So that's number one. Um, you know, I think number two, and one of the things that I've always, you know, mentioned in our conversations is that I think it's also going to have impacts in research. Mm -hmm. um, you know, to this day, the major, you know, a good majority of, of clinical trials evaluating asthma treatments still utilize the peak flow, right? Which is certainly a useful measure when trying to understand the efficacy of some sort of intervention, like say for an asthma medication and all those kind of things. But it still doesn't, it does, it's not quite nearly as comprehensive as the numbers that we get from spirometry. Um, and so whether in clinical trials um, and also even in epidemiology and other, um, you know, population-based research, you know, utilizing this, this tool can now really add a lot of um, depth in terms of the information that we're getting in terms of, right, the impacts of air pollution or even a, a, a you know, 52-week, you know, trial of an intervention for an asthma medication where we can now utilize um, remote patient monitoring to get even more frequent monitoring, right? Because one of the rate limiting factors when it comes to, um, you know, re medical research is funding and it takes time and money to bring patients from wherever they are enrolled to that testing center to get blood testing, surveys, and also lung function tests. So if we can like now decrease the cost associated where you can decrease the number of visits in, you know, in-person visits, and now you can get even more frequent lung function measurements for whatever outcome that you're measuring, um, again, in terms of population-based research for clinical trials, you may actually bring drive down the cost of research and therefore that may potentially even translate to lower costs for the patient later on when that medication actually comes out to the market, right? Um, so, I mean, that's a broadly over, over simplistic, uh, you know, uh, conclusion to that, of course. But I think, again, it, it's going to affect both just day-to-day -day healthcare 
but also in terms of how we advance our knowledge in healthcare in terms of research in that too, so. Mm -hmm. And how do you think Aluna can help revolutionize the way doctors manage their patients for through lung, monitoring lung function remotely? Right. Well, I, you know, I, you know, in, in this day and age, there are a, a whole slew of, of digital health platforms and you know electronic health record systems and, and all these kind of things. And the, the first thing that may potentially be um, an obstacle for adoption of any kind of new technology, whether for a physician group or practice and those kind of things, right, is, is that barrier to say, how am I going to actually work this into my daily workflow, right? Um, a physician's time, unfortunately, is packed with other things beyond just taking care of patients. And so, you know, that is where it, I think it's be important for Aluna to help understand. I think Aluna understands now, like, how that works, you know, partnering with, you know, multiple physician, numerous physician practices and individual physicians and also academic groups and all these kinds of things, you know, you're in a position to better understand how that workflow fits so that it's integrated more seamlessly so that it truly can be utilized right sooner right and to, and to the maximum effect so that it actually helps right it helps our patients because that's really what matters most um and of course when we see that in terms of improved outcomes then it, it plays out more into like reduced costs and all these kind of things um so I think the fact that it's not just a biotech company, right? That Aluna, through its partnerships, can understand more about how what it is that the you know physicians do, regardless of practice, whether it's in private practice or an academic you know, institution like UCSF, right? To say like this is how we can implement this new technology um, into whatever you know whatever uh, you know setting it may be. And so, why did you choose to partner with Aluna? Well, I, th I thought, I, you know, I think, it, it, how long has it been now? I think it's been at least seven years um, or longer. Probably I, longer. I, I, recall even. 50, I, I recall at least 2014, if, if, if memory serves me right. So we're, we're going on seven years now. Um, and I think, again, where, uh, it's, as, as, as funny as it may sound, it's, this is still something where it's an untapped market, quite honestly. Um, and you know, it, it's, I'm not necessarily surprised at how long it's been already. I mean, time has flown, but at the same time, it really has taken that long to really develop the algorithms with which to, to say, yes, you know, one of the rate limiting, one of the main limitations of doing spirometry outside of the in-hospital or clinical setting has always been, and I've always said this on numerous occasions, it's always been the technician. Um, and yes, Aluna has long had people much smarter than me trying to figure out how do you recreate that pulmonary function technician that can actually then result in giving, resulting incredible data for which then I as the clinician can utilize to make my, to make my, to help with my medical decision-making, you know, and I know it hasn't, I know it hasn't been, you know, an easy process, um, but, um, you know, but I already saw that there was already, you know, through you and the rest of the Aluna team, um, that there was certainly um, a commitment and, you know, the commitment to truly saying like, yes, we understand the problem. Uh, we don't have an answer to it right away, but we're going to keep at it. Right? And, and you have. And, I, and I'm certainly proud of that um, in terms of what you've accomplished. But um, truly, I think it's, that's really what it was. Um, that, um, you know, at least here in the Bay Area, the, the culture here, the, the overall environment here, I think it's always been primed for these kind of innovative biotechnology uh, projects, you know. Um, and certainly, you know, with certainly acknowledging my bias, yes, it was something where there was a promise of, of helping, of course, the patients that I see on a day-to-day -day basis, and and then some. Um, and so, yes, it's it's been a lot of fun, I think, working with you uh, these years, um, and it's been it's been really exciting to see how how Luna has evolved. Um, you know, oh, I can I can still remember the very first the first early prototypes that we saw um, that were three D printed, and now we have this very you know, slick product, but be underneath the slickness, of course, is the fact that we truly have a, a, a device that, you know, can provide, again, credible data with which to make, you know, sound decisions when we're taking care of our patients. So, 